We shall go ahead and get started. We're on the hour. Well, welcome everyone to this workshop on 101 budgeting. We're excited that you're joining us here today. My name is Rochelle Espiritu, and I am the project director for the NEDS National Facilitation Center. Welcome. I will be going over a few logistics and the agenda for the day. And the first order of business is to provide this disclaimer that the webinar is to give broad and general advice on putting a competitive grants application with a focus on budget. Our intention is not to comment or give any advice on a specific application or scenario, but we will provide you with some contact information for later. So welcome again to Budget 101 Workshop. This is a collaboration between the NED and SAMHSA. And as many of you may know, the NED is a large and vibrant network of over 5,000 individuals, including more than 1,200 community-based organizations that are striving for behavioral health equity for all individuals, families, and communities. We're pleased to be able to partner with SAMHSA and the Office for Behavioral Health to offer this workshop for you that is around elevating CBOs. So just a few things about the, the Zoom platform. We do invite you to ask questions throughout the session today. Please do put those into the Q&A box so that we can monitor those. If you have comments that you would like to share, please go ahead and do that through the comment or the chat section of your Zoom screen. We do have closed captioning available through Zoom using the CC button or the full live transcript option is available as well. Resources and the recording of this workshop will be available following the webinar on the NED website, nned.net. And we do value your feedback. So please do let us know what you're taking away from this particular workshop and help inform what we might provide for you in future workshops as well. And so we will be providing a survey, uh, survey link to you after the workshop itself. Okay, so here is our agenda for today. We will be doing the welcome. And then we will be hearing a little bit about a, a recap that was done for the Grants 101 workshop. Then you'll hear from two, uh, two colleagues around Budget 101 and hear from uh, another panelist who'll be sharing a CBO experience. And we have left plenty of time for Q&A. So we have called through your questions that you submitted through your registration form. And we have several of those that will be posed to the panelists. And again, we do invite you to send any questions throughout the workshop itself as well. So here are our objectives for today. We want to provide an overview of project um, budget development. You will hear from our panelists about the importance of an accurate project budget. They will also be introducing some of the different budget terminology that you will see in announcements, as well as offer some tips and advice on cost estimates. We hope that you'll also leave um, with learning about budgeting and successful grant applications from a CBO or a community-based organization perspective. And so with that, it is my pleasure to now pass it over to Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, who is the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at SAMHSA to welcome everyone. Dr. Rittman. Thank you so much, Rachel, and, and a good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it, it's just such a pleasure to be here, and I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you all. I've been watching the chat, and boy, folks are coming from all over the place, so it's just wonderful to see uh, such wide representation from across the, the country, really. So uh, wonderful community that's, that's been created already here through this webinar. Um, so, you know, I, I want to take a little bit of time just to introduce myself, since I know for many of you, maybe my first time uh, uh, with you. Uh, so about two months ago, uh, I was confirmed as the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at SAMHSA and HHS. Uh, prior to my taking on this role, I served as commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for six years, 
um, where I had the opportunity to support and work closely with many community-based organizations. Um, through my 20-year career in the behavioral health field, and, and especially during my time as commissioner, um, I've been committed really to promoting recovery-oriented, integrated, uh, culture-responsive services and systems, and have focused particularly on systems that offer dignity, respect, uh, and meaningful community inclusion. Um, I'm excited about uh, today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is a second uh, brought to you by the Elevating CBO Initiative. Uh, the Elevating CBOs is a newly uh, overarching policy-driven initiative at SAMHSA's Office of Behavioral Health Equity. Um, goals of this initiative are to build capacity, increase visibility, and highlight the unique role of CBOs serving underserved communities in behavioral health. Um, the initiative engages four strategies uh, to accomplish its goals, including education, partnership, technical assistance, and equity dialogue. Um, earlier this year, Elevate CBOs offered a workshop on Grant 101, um, and today we're so excited to continue the conversation on developing budgets for grant applications. Um, we're so grateful for our partnership with the Office of Grants within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Fiscal Resources, of HHS and also the West Care Foundation. And we know through these partnerships, we've been able to invite a number of just excellent speakers to share their experience on budget development uh, as part of the grant application process. Um, what makes today's webinar unique is that in addition to the expertise the speakers bring on budget and grant management, they've also had strong ties and working relationships with CBOs. Um, today's webinar, is intended to help many CBOs across the nation that are minority serving or under-resourced, including many of our NED partners. Uh, SAMHSA is working hard to close the gap in access to resources that are often a major barrier uh, to our minority serving CBOs. I'd like to now take a, a moment to offer a special thanks to Shanta Jackson, uh, to Ladiva Harris, uh, Beverly Watts Davis, and Dr. Beverly Vanger. Uh, for agreeing to speak at today's webinar and to share all of their knowledge on uh, the topics uh, that we'll be discussing today. Um, and before I wrap up, I, I do just want to acknowledge that September uh, is National Suicide Awareness Month as well as National Recovery Month. Uh, and many of you I know in the audience are heroes uh, who are working every day to prevent uh, suicide and promote recovery. Um, so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you uh, all of you for the tireless work you do uh, to address behavioral health within our communities. Um, again, thank you for your participation and I hope everyone has a, a fruitful webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Delphin Rittman. It's a pleasure to have you join us this today for this workshop. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Beverly Vehinger has her PhD in counseling psychology. She's worked for over 30 years for Prince George's County in Maryland's Depart health department in the division of addictions and mental health. For the last 15 years of her tenure with the county, she was the program director of an intensive outpatient program providing substance use and mental health services for women, including pregnant women and women with children. She's been at SAMHSA for eight years, and for three and a half years, she worked in the Division of Grant Review and currently works in the Office of Management, Analysis, and Coordination, with her duties focusing on grant planning, grants announcements, and providing training for applicants and grantees. So unfortunately, she was not able to join us live for today's webinar, but we are going to play a recording that she made with Perry Chan that provides a recap of the Elevate CBO's webinar series Grant 101 workshop that was held in March. Okay, I'm glad to join you all this afternoon. Just want to give you an overview of some of the material that I presented um, a few months ago, just to get give you some understanding of understanding both about SAMHSA grants and some of the things you need to pay attention to when you're responding to SAMHSA grant applications. One of the things I want to bring your attention to since the last webinars, we have posted on the grants.gov website, a forecast of some of the grants that we will be offering during the upcoming fiscal year. We posted that at the end of July. There are now 17 grants on the grants.gov website. If you go to the, that website, 
go to the main grants webpage and you'll see a, a tab that says search. And you click on that and then on that webpage, you're going to find a box that says forecasted. Click on that and then type in the keyword SAMHSA and that'll bring up the 17 grants that we are going to be posting in the upcoming fiscal year. That's not an exhaustive list of the grants that we will be offering, but it is the ones we know right now that we will be posting during the upcoming months. Just to give you a word of caution, the dates we have there for posting, those are estimated dates, so don't get concerned if the, the grant is not actually posted on that particular date. Just want to remind everyone that there are four different registration processes that you must complete to even be able to apply for a SAMHSA grant. And if you go to the SAMHSA website on the grants, the grants webpage, you'll find that there's an explanation of the four different registration processes. So I encourage you, if you're not already registered for those four different entities, to do that right away because it takes a little time for all those to get processed. I also encourage you to look at the manual on the SAMHSA website. And if you contact me, if you can't find it, I will um, send you the link. It's a manual entitled Developing a Competitive SAMHSA Grant Application. It has a lot of valuable information that you will find useful in preparing an application for the upcoming season. So I just want to quickly review some of the things that I mentioned in that webinar about some things to pay attention to when you're applying for a grant. First thing you definitely need to look at are the eligibility criteria for a particular grant. Just make, to make sure that your organization is eligible to apply for that grant. Also, in terms of responding to the evaluation criteria, just want to give you some, some of the tips that I mentioned during the previous webinar. One is that one of the things that reviewers are going to be looking for is a lot of detail in your responses to the evaluation criteria. I can't emphasize that enough that they want to see some, a lot of specifics in terms of how you're going to implement the project. So pay attention to what type of information you're providing in your responses to the evaluation criteria and make sure that there's a lot of detailed information there. It's going to be also important for you to provide a clear picture for the reviewers as to what the need is in your particular community. What are the problems that your community is facing relative to mental health or substance use problems or prevention and provide some concrete data to, to show the reviewers that there are some real concerns in your community. And then in the evaluation, when you're responding to the evaluation criteria, document how you're going to respond to, to some of the needs that you've identified. What are some of the service gaps that are present in your community? Another thing to pay attention to, you must have strong goals and measurable objectives. That's another thing that the reviewers are going to be looking for. And those goals and objectives must relate back to some of the problems that you identified in your community. I also highly recommend that you look at there are two appendices in the grant announcement that are going to be invaluable in preparing strong goals and measurable objectives. And that's one of the area that a lot of applicants don't pay attention to when they're developing their project narrative. They don't have strong goals. The goals don't relate to some of the problems in the community and their objectives are not measurable. So look at the two appendices in the grant announcement. One is entitled Developing Strong Goals and Measurable Objectives. And the second appendix relates to data collection and performance measurement, because you will also be asked to describe what your plan is for data collection and performance measurement. And in that appendix, there are sp specific bullets in that appendix that tell you exactly what you need to respond to in terms of discussing your plan for data collection and performance measurement. And it's also important to make sure that you have all the staff for the project that are going to be able to actually in, implement the project. Pay attention to the key personnel that are identified in the grant announcement because those key personnel must be part of your staffing component. And one of the key personnel is always going to be the project director, but just make sure that you have staff that are going to be able to implement the project. Another thing to pay attention to is that Almost all of the evaluation criteria, there are multiple pieces of information you need to include in your response. And that's another area that a lot of applicants don't effectively respond to. They address some of the components of the evaluation criteria, but they don't provide all the required information. So pay attention to the fact 
of all the elements that you must respond to in each one of the evaluation criteria and make sure that you've addressed each one of those elements. Another thing to just is that this is not part of the project narrative or evaluation criteria, but another piece of the application is responding to the participant protection criteria. If you're providing services as part of a SAMHSA grant project, you must address how you're going to make sure that you have strong participant protection for the participants in your program. So in one of the appendices, there are guidelines about how you need to respond to the participant protection criteria. I recommend that you respond to each one of the elements in that particular appendix. It also within each one of those elements, there are a number of bullets that must be addressed. There are no page limits for the response to the participant protection criteria. So please make sure you provide detailed responses to those criteria. And finally, in terms of the budget, there are specific instructions in the budget about how you need to prepare your budget in the different cost centers where you're going to be outlining how you're going to spend the funds for the project. I just want to make you aware of the fact that in the the grant announcement that we are going to be posting shortly, we have included a link to a template on the SAMHSA website for developing your budget. So we will highly encourage you to use that template. It'll make it a lot easier for you to prepare your budget. And in terms of preparing your budget, the one thing I would recommend is to make sure that the budget that you prepare, the that the information you include on some of the forms that you have to prepare for part of your application, that those forms match what's in your budget. Let me give an example. On the standard form 424A, which is the budget form that must be submitted with your application, there are a number of sections within the 424A related to your budget. And the key thing is to make sure that the totals in each one of those sections match, because those, if the totals don't match, you're, you will get an error message when you try to submit your application and that you're going to have to correct that before you're going to be able to get your application successfully received by SAMHSA. So just make sure you read the instructions carefully about completing the standard form 424A, which requires you to enter all your budget data. And finally, just want to make you aware that I'm going to be repeating the same webinar I offered in March in September and October. And if you weren't able to access the webinar at that time, I encourage you to join the webinar in the uh, upcoming months because I'm going to go over in detail a lot of the information that I presented in March. And it's particularly important to maybe participate in the webinar before you actually prepare to submit an application because in the webinar I give a lot of examples and I give a lot more tips about how to prepare a strong application and things that you need to be aware of when you're responding to the evaluation criteria. So. Perry will give you some information on how to access those webinars that are upcoming. So that's all I, the sort of a summary of what I discussed in March, just in terms of the highlights of that particular webinar. Thank you so much, Beth. This is very, very helpful recap from our last workshop. Uh, it helped us to set up the stage for today's webinar about Budget 101. Thank you so much again uh, for your support. And if anyone in today's webinar has any question, we encourage all of us to reach out to you and your email would be listed in the slides later on. Thank you so much again. Great. Thank you, Perry and Dr. Behinger. It, it's a lot of information in a short amount of time that recaps a, a full other workshop. So we do encourage you to check out the recording or go to the upcoming ones that will be available. Alina has posted that information into the chat for you, and it is also in our slide deck, which we will send out to you as a follow up. So now I'd like to introduce Shanta and Ladiva, who will be presenting together today on putting together a project budget and narrative overview, completing a budget, and sharing some helpful hints. Shanta Johnson is the director of the HHS Office of Grants Division of Workforce Development. With more than 32 years in federal service, she has expertise in del delivering and developing training materials regarding policy, regulatory, and operational content for staff engaged in program management, 
federal contract contracting and small business advocacy. She's a renowned speaker and has de delivered training to federal agencies as well as external stakeholders seeking to do business with the federal government. Her training efforts have reached over 10,000 stakeholders, including one of her most notable accomplishments being is being selected by a former agency to lead the creation of the Business Breakthrough Training Initiative for the White House between 2010 and 2012. Nadiva Harris is the HHS Office of Grants Division of Workforce Development Team Lead. In her 11 years as a grant management specialist, Ladiva managed a portfolio of roughly 640 discretionary and non-discretionary grants, totaling $1.5 billion. She also trains new hires, peers, and leadership on all aspects of the grant's life cycle. Her experience includes reviewing notice of funding opportunities for publication, processing prior approvals and closeouts, reviewing financial reports, and providing recipient technical assistance, as well as re-engineering internal and external business processes to streamline operations. So, um, you are going to hear a lot of great information from these two panelists, and I'm happy to turn it over to you both to go through your material. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs yeah. up. Very good. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity, first and foremost. Um, want to acknowledge and give special thanks to Dr. Delvin Rittman and also Trina Duda. I hope I have the name right, Perry. Uh, Dr. Mary Rory. And of course, Perry, I think what SAMHSA is doing with this webinar series is absolutely fantastic. And the Division of Workforce Development and the Office of Grants is super excited to be included in this important effort. So as you heard in the introduction, we're going to have kind of a tag team approach uh, to this presentation. And just to level set for the audience, because I really appreciate that SAMHSA gave us some background about how familiar the audience is with this process. So we built this training to make sure that we really stay at a one-on-one -on -one level. And so for the first part of the presentation, I'm gonna kind of lay the foundation and give you all some understanding, hopefully to help make this whole grant application process make even more sense. And then I'm gonna to toss the rest of the presentation over to my team lead and colleague, who um, I'm thrilled to have, who is a subject matter expert of all things technical about grants management. And collectively, we hope that we can give you all exactly what it is that you came to uh, get out of today's training. So we will go right into the next slide, please. And you can go ahead and, okay, thank you. So just stating the obvious here, some of the things that we've already said that we're gonna make sure we accomplish today. And we can go to the next slide. And our learning objectives, we wanna be very upfront just to let you know from the beginning, we're going to talk specifically about the basic components of a project budget, defining some of those key budget narrative categories and terminology, and then the really good stuff to complete the steps necessary for preparing a budget narrative. And what is a budget project, budget, and a budget narrative? And whoever's driving the slides can go ahead and kind of click through everything. I know the animation and timing, I'll make it easy for you. Thank you so much. And so first, the project budget. This is what we are looking for. Applicants are really expected to give us an understanding of staying within the funding limits, but what they're going to do within this project. One of the things that you will hear us say over and over again in this presentation is how critical it is to pay close attention to the notice of funding opportunity. The NOFO that you'll hear us call it is so important because it really is kind of like your lifeline. Everything that you're gonna to need to know about this particular grant, it is going to be spelled out in the NOFO. It's going to be the, the um, resource that you go back over and over and over again to make sure that you are coloring within the right framework for responding to this particular NOFO. One of the things that we always wanna make sure that applicants understand early in the process because it can be a source of frustration all grants are not created equal, meaning 
What some of you may have done if you're with a nonprofit or a university and worked with another part of HHS or even another grant making agency, what you had to go through to get that funding will be completely different for what you may have to do with a grant that SAMHSA is awarding. So we wanna kind of make sure that we get everyone to understand this is a process that you will have to depend on the terms and conditions and the information that's provided in the NOFO so you can know how to respond to this particular opportunity. Um, the recording that we had a little earlier talked about the form 424A, and I wanted to, and we're gonna show you that a little later on in the presentation, but that's the um, part of the, of the uh, budget template where you're gonna to have to give us the information about your project budget. When you go over to the project narrative, now this is when you really get down into the nitty gritty of explaining to us how you as the applicant will use the funds that are being requested. And we want lots of details. If you guys haven't figured this out now, we love details, right? So we want to know how you're gonna spend these funds. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the level of detail we want with that information. So yes, we are gonna want a, an explanation of your total cost, the direct and the indirect, the federal and the non-federal. And we're gonna um, also look for this narrative to really tell us and give us an explanation of how the grant funds will be spent. And one of the things that I've kind of learned over time is sometimes an applicant will look at a notice of funding opportunity, a NOFO, and they'll say, okay, SAMHSA has a NOFO for $500,000. So, all right, guys, let's spend it every single dime. And we're just going to start coming up with how we're going to spend all of this money. That's really not what we have learned is the best approach. The recommendation, because certainly this is how your organization chooses to approach this task, but it's really important that you sit down and think about what the project is and kind of think it through with a, an integrated project team in your organization where everyone can come together and think about what really is required for this particular project to be successful. I like to even call it, you know, make a caviar plan, you know, talk about what will it take for everything in this program to really get to be the outcomes that your organization desires it to be? Because we want you to think about that on the front end, because when it's time for you to give us, us, us your narrative and think about in all the details we're gonna be asking you for, we don't want you to come into this kind of like, oh, I didn't think about that, or oh, we didn't discuss that, or oh, we never considered that. So that's why the recommendation is to kind of think about the project really, really in detail and have a lot of really um, detailed conversation within your organization before you start trying to apply to the NOFO. Next slide, please. And once again, just kind of underscoring the importance of a detailed uh, budget narrative. And I think I've said all of this already. This is, um, don't hold back at all in your narrative. The, as much detail as you can give to the government in your narrative, the happier we will be with it. Um, we want to see what you plan to do, how this plan is going to help the uh, recipient carry out the project. So details, details, details matter um, when it comes to giving us your budget narrative. Next slide, please. And so this is just a quick look at what Ladiva and I are gonna divide between the two of us and discuss with each of you and spend a little bit of time giving you some um, detailed information about each one of these. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, first and foremost, I just don't like to assume that everybody walks around knowing how uh, federal financial assistance works or how grants programs work. So HHS just doesn't sit down and have a big pot of money that we just kind of get to give out as we deem appropriate as it comes to grants. Really, Congress has an appropriations process and they give the money, um, decide how the money is going to be appropriated. And then once that decision is made, that money is then given to the grant making agencies. Right now we have about I think 33 federal grant making agencies officially, we have about 26 
that are active right now. So it sounds kind of funny to say that, but I've had people say to me like, oh, AJ Justice has all this money. Well, no, Congress just gives us the money and they give us the direction and the statutes of how that money needs to be managed in the grants program. So kind of just want you to understand how we get to this whole grant process. The funds are appropriated and they come from Congress and then they're given to the grant making agency. And then the agency is responsible for making sure that the funds are managed um, appropriately through the grants program. So when we talk about the federal share of a notice of funding opportunity, the federal share is the portion of the award where you're actually gonna be using the federal financial assistance funds. Pretty straightforward. On the non-federal share of the, of the equation, this is when we talk about the project costs that are not gonna be made using any of those federal funds. You can provide, this non-federal share can be provided in the form of matching and cost sharing. And just for those that may be new to this whole conversation, a lot of times those terms are kind of interchangeable, but what do we mean when we say matching? When you look at the notice of funding opportunity, you will see that there is a statutorily specified percentage that's been included in that document that will tell you how much the applicant will have to match. Sometimes it'll be 10%, 20, we've even seen 50% or higher. So I'm gonna keep saying this to kind of drive the point home, about how important it is to have the NOFO. I hate to tell you to take it with you on the weekend, but you really need to be familiar with your NOFO and you need to be clear about what SAMHSA or whoever the um, awarding um, grant making agency is, that you're clear about what the instructions are in that particular NOFO because every NOFO will be different as long as your organization continues to pursue federal funding what you do for one grant making agency or one division or organization within an agency will be different from the next um, NOFO you respond to. That's very important, so remember that. Next slide, please. So in the non-federal share, um, we call that cost sharing. And this is a situation in where a grant recipient shares in the cost of the project um, other than that statutorily required matching that I just talked about. The thing that is really important for you all to think about and to remember is in the cost sharing, there's something called in-kind contributions for those of you that may be new to this process. In-kind contributions include goods or services that can be donated to your organization. These are just a few examples of what could be considered in-kind uh, contributions. You can talk about pro bono professional services. I like to give examples. So just to imagine if you're with an organization and you have a relationship with, you're going to hold a conference. And in that conference, you may have a relationship with a community college or some kind of event venue. And because of that relationship that you have, that conference venue may say, well, you know, because we have this relationship and we want to support what it is that you're doing, we're going to offer you the space for free, or we may offer you the space at a reduced rate. That's an example of an in-kind contribution. And you will be, have to show the government the, um, the value, the market value for what that in-kind service is. But make sure when you're doing that IPT meeting I talked about before you even start trying to put together your application that you sit down and think about all the relationships that you can leverage where you can uh, possibly get in-kind contributions to help with the non-federal share portion um, of the NOFO. Next slide, please. And we can go ahead and click through that one as well. So how long do you have? The project period is important to remember and it is separate and distinct from the budget period. The project period as the definition says here, this is the start of the initial federal award and the proposed end date. What I like to really make sure you zero in on about budget periods are, sometimes some of you will have a grant that is fully funded at the time of award. You'll have all the money that you're gonna have for the entire uh, period of that particular um, grant and you won't have to worry about having 
you know, to come back and, and deal with other budget periods or budget periods ending. But you can also have a budget period for a project that may be, it may be a five year grant, but you may have a budget period that's five one year intervals. So you could have multiple budget periods within a project period, but it all depends on how the instructions that came with the funds from Congress spell out how it's gonna be funded. There are all kinds of conversations that we can get into offline about the weird things that can happen with funding as it comes to a particular project. But once again, in your NOFO, um, there's a funding information section that will explain to you how this project is being funded and how you should go forward in planning and managing the funding of the project. So don't assume just because you know what the project period is, that automatically means that you're funded for that whole period. Make sure if you're taking notes that you pay special attention to the budget period so you'll know when funding will be available and how you have to go about uh, receiving it throughout the life of this particular, of the project. Next slide, please. Now, this is where we're gonna to get to the good stuff. Uh, we're gonna start talking about these direct cost categories. And all of these are applicable, but we did a little research because we are not a part of SAMHSA. As we heard in the intro, we work for the Office of the Secretary in the um, Office of Grants. So we learned that SAMHSA does not deal in construction um, based on the information that we did on your website. So we're gonna talk about all of these direct categories except for construction, okay? Next slide, please. Now, personnel, that's pretty straightforward. Personnel should contain a breakdown of all the staff salaries that are going to be involved in helping to execute this project. What I want you to pay special attention to as it relates to personnel are a couple of things. As it relates to individual salaries, the government has a should not exceed salary cap that changes from year to year. We did some research just to make sure we could share with you the salary cap maximum for this year is 199,300. But this salary cap changes, ladies and gentlemen. So you have to make sure that once again, you are um, you can talk to your grants management specialist or um, in your NOFO. I don't know if it's listed in NOFO, we had to research this, but I wanted to call out to you specifically that when you are including the individual salaries, you do have to be aware of the cap that exists. And also remember that the salary cap does not include fringe and indirect costs, which we'll be talking about in the following slides. I also wanna point out that when you think about personnel, it's very easy sometimes to think about contractors or consultants that you may have that uh, you're gonna bring on board or want to bring on board to help support the project. When we talk about consultants, that'll be later on in the slide deck when we start talking about contractual activity. Consultant salary should not be included in personnel. And that's confusing for a lot of companies or a lot of applicants. So we wanna make sure that we call that out and let you know that you show the consultant salaries um, in another place in your budget template. Um, and the last footnote here that you can all see, because um, I talked about appropriations coming from Congress and how there are different stipulations and statutory directives for each NOFO. There are certain appropriations that you may not have a salary cap that I just mentioned. And we've given you an example here of the American Rescue Plan Act as an example of one of those that does not have the salary cap, but the NOFO, the NOFO, the NOFO. That is where you're going to keep going back to and getting familiar with to make sure you can find out what those nuances are for the particular project that you're applying for. Next slide, please. Fringe benefits, we all love fringe benefits, right? This is what your employer gives you um, in addition to your salary. So this is where we see the compensations and include some of the things we've listed here. Um, the cost of vacation, sick leave, employee insurance, uh, pensions. Sometimes, of course, when we get into university space or other space, we might even see tuition reimbursement and things like that. The one thing that I want to call out about the fringe benefits that I want all of you to bookmark, if you haven't already, the CFR, which is the Code of Federal Regulations, they have an electronic version. It's literally ecfr.gov. 
bookmark it on your phone, on your iPad, on your laptop. This is where you're going to always see in NOFOs and any kind of grants um, document. This is where you go back and find out where the regulations are that drive the conversations that you're going to be having with your uh, grants management specialist throughout the life of the project. And so the notation that we've made here on the bottom, the 45 CFR 75.431, this is the government's um, instructions for fringe benefits. So I wanted to just kind of do a little commercial there about you have to, I can't stress enough about book, uh, bookmarking the CFR because you're going to be having to go back to it and look at it quite often. All right, the next slide, please. And travel. So we definitely understand that there's travel that's related to the project. Um, what I like to say first and foremost is you'd be surprised at some of the people that think this is a great way for them to go to Turks and Caicos, um, take the family or do some kind of weird things. No, no, no. This travel is about the project. <laughs> I see Ms. Beverly is like, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, the travel absolutely uh, is covered, but these are expenses that include lodging, um, M&IE, which is me meals and incidental expenses, um, lodging, transportation, but all official business um, related to this project and the project staff. Um, I like to point out the travel for consultants and contractors should be shown in the, contra in the contractual section of the um, budget template, and we'll talk about contraction in a couple of minutes. And I think what's most important here is that someone that may be new or an applicant that is just starting out in this process, you know, how do you find out what does the government allow you to spend for travel? How do you find out what you can and can't do? And that's GSA, the General Services Administration is a government agency that sets the uh, travel standards for the federal government. And so the link that we've given you here lets you know um, what those per diem rates are from state to state and how much we allow for our uh, travel and lodging, uh, depending on where you are in, in the U.S. So those are the things that I want to point out around that. So remember, no first class flights, no extra extravagant um, use of grant funds for travel. And you want to make sure that you, too, um, bookmark this website to find out what you can spend and what you can't spend as it relates to travel. The next slide, please. Now the equipment, what we've given you here, we went right to the regulations and gave you, when I say the regulations, we're talking about the, the CFR and we've given you the definition for equipment. We all understand that this is not a lovely definition. Um, <laughs> we've even had so much conversation about it within the Office of Grants that it is now on the, um, to-do list for some of our grants leadership to really go back and revisit this um, and come up with a way that we think is a little more plain language. So the big takeaway from equipment that I want you all to leave with is the first bullet. Equipment is about identifying property that is a useful life of more than one year. And it also exceeds $5,000. Now, when you get into equipment, there's going to be, and, and I don't want any applicant to feel like they have to go through this process in a vacuum and there's nobody that you can talk to while you're going through this process. Um, there are grants management specialists. You're about, Lodiva was one before she joined my team. SAMHSA has them. They provide technical assistance to you as um, applicants to help you understand and get clarity in this process where you might not be really clear about what the government is looking for, what SAMHSA is looking for. So the big thing about quit equipment is property, a useful life of more than one year, over $5,000 in value. And the second bullet I wanna stress because justification, justification, justification. You can't just come to a grant making agency, SAMHSA, since we're talking about SAMHSA and say, Yes, this project, and we need to buy everybody a 2021 um, Lamborghini to make sure that this project hits the goals and outcomes that we want it to have. Like, 
it sounds like it's something that's funny, but you see a lot of applicants that don't really understand. We do our research in the government to make sure that the equipment that you're saying you need, we look for quotes. We're going to do research to make sure that the estimate ha is, is um, reasonable within fair market value. So it's not an opportunity to just kind of say, hey, Sam, so this is what we say we need and that Sam's is not gonna go back and do some research to make sure that um, the equipment cost that you've outlined in your um, budget are, are, are indeed a fair market value. So that's the thing about equipment I want you to remember and always know you can talk to your grants management specialist about things where you might need a little more clarity or to make sure you can say, you know, we think this is equipment, but is it a supply or vice versa? You can have that, that dialogue. So don't be afraid or intimidated to reach out and do that. They're, they're happy to get you up, give you clarification if you need, need it around those things. The, um, the only other thing I wanted to say about this slide, when I looked in the regulation under equipment, they include things, uh, they list office modular furniture as an example of equipment, motor vehicles in some instances, uh, phone closets and things like that you'll find in the uh, regulation as an example of equipment, but there are tons of other things that apply. So just giving you that example for you to consider, have for consideration. The next slide, please. And if it's not equipment, is it a, is it a supply? And so what, once again, we've given you the regulatory definition for supplies and the big change between equipment and supplies is the supplies we define as having a useful life of normally um, not having to deal with the useful life stipulation that I talked about for equipment. And we also look at supplies as something that's typically less than $5,000. So the justification for these supplies, you may have to give an explanation of the type of supplies to be purchased, how the supplies relate back to achieving the project objectives, you will always have to do that for every direct cost that you give us. It's not just supplies for all of them. We're gonna always be looking for the reach back to see how it's a direct correlation to the project. And the basis for the estimate of the supplies, the historical use on similar projects um, and things like that. So supplies are normally things that are under 5,000. The useful life um, stipulation is not in play. And once again, if you think it's a supply, but you're not really sure, I strongly encourage you to reach out and ask the um, grants management specialist that's assigned because they can help you with clarity on that. And the next slide, please. And here's contractual that I talked about a couple of times before. Uh, contractual costs are those services that are carried out by individuals or organizations where you have a procurement relationship, where you actually have a, uh, a signed contract arrangement with this particular um, entity. And it can be in the form of a subaward, not you know, only just a first tier contract and be a subaward, a consultant or consortium agreement. Uh, the thing about the contractual piece that I want, really wanna underscore for you, if you find yourself working with sub awards or con we, the government will only talk to you as our recipient. The flow down of the terms and conditions and any kind of other um, nuances within the no flow, no flow have to be carried down by your organization to the sub-recipients. The government does not talk or interact with sub-recipients. And that's really important because a lot of times folks, applicants are not aware of that. And that is not something we do. We talk to the applicant that we're working with and not any of your subs. All right. And I'm going to get to the next slide so I can get Ladiva on. And other, what in the world is that? So basically everything that I haven't already said um, is in the other category. That's your rent, telephones, um, postage, and the big thing about other is, and I know I sound like a broken record, but we I've heard of it being such a, a trip for, you know, a place of concern for so many applicants that if you have a direct cost and you really don't know where it fits, you can reach out and talk to your GMS and get clarity about where it should fit. So 
Don't let that be a source of discouragement and don't let it be a source of frustration because you do have technical assistance that will be uh, made available to you. So this is where I stop and I want to just kind of reintroduce Ladiva to you. I'm happy to have her on my team. She is um, a technical whiz and she's a former grants management specialist and she's going to take us through the end of the presentation and then together we'll answer any questions that you all have if we still have any time. Thank you. Myself off mute, sorry. Thank you, Shanta. Um, Shanta is always such a hard act to follow. So um, <laughs> I'm going to just hop right in and get started on our indirect costs. So Shanta basically just covered all of our direct costs. So when you are preparing your budget, your total budget consists of direct costs and indirect costs. So <clears throat> your indirect costs are going to be anything. Um, that is not specific to that particular grant. That's not just solely for that grant. I've been looking in the chat. I see people asking about different things and where they would allocate certain costs, like um, their um, their HR stuff of that stuff like that. Um, those types of things may find themselves in your indirect cost section because it may be something you're sharing across your agency. Your um, HR department or your payroll department is not specifically only handling the HR and payroll aspect for that grant program you're applying for. So when this is something that is shared across the organization, it finds itself in the indirect cost category. Um, a few things that I want to highlight from here that you want to pay attention to when you're um, applying for an award and when you're considering doing indirect costs in your award. First of all, um, in 45 CFR 75.414, HHS, and I want to call this out because this is an HHS specific regulation, HHS puts an 8% cap on indirect costs for training and technical assistance grants. So if you are looking at your NOFO, I know Shanta emphasized the importance of, of keeping that handy. When you're looking at your NOFO, you want to make sure that you're looking in your eligibility information section of the NOFO. That's where you're going to see things about your match and other things, but you should also be able to find information as it pertains to your indirect cost. And if there is an indirect cost cap, it should also spell out within the NOFO whether or not this is a training or technical assistance grant. So if it is, again, it would speak to this 8% cap. Now you may be wondering, how does that affect me if I am at an agency that has an indirect cost rate agreement that's already negotiated? And let's say our rate is 35%, but I can only claim 8%. That 27% difference is classified as what we call our unrecovered indirect costs. And that's just the difference between what you can claim and your approved rate. And with that being the case, unrecovered indirect costs can actually be claimed as part of your cost share and matching, which Shanta also discussed um, earlier, your non-federal share. So you are capable of applying those unrecovered indirect costs towards your cost share and matching. So if you are in one of those programs where um, you do have a higher match requirement, um, this will help you out a little bit with coming up with um, the, the sources for your match requirement. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to direct um, costs as well as Indirect costs, we also have what are called your modified total direct costs. And your modified total direct costs, or you may see it referred to as an MTDC, is going to apply to your salaries, your wages, um, your fringe benefits, material supplies, up to 25% of each of your subawards in the event that you have that you have a subaward. But things like tuition re, um, remission, uh, rental costs, scholarships, fellowships, I think I saw some people talking about tuition in the chat as well. Those types of things, anything in, in excess over that 25,000 for each subaward, those things are not gonna be part of your modified total direct cost. And the reason that you wanna pay attention to this and why it's important, and we can um, go to the next slide for that, is that we have this thing called a de minimis rate. So you may have 
a um, approved indirect cost rate agreement within your organization. Um, states use cost allocation plans in lieu of indirect cost rate agreements. Not sure if we have any states on or not, but you may have these rates already approved. And that's great. If you do not, you have the option of using what is called our de minimis rate. And the de minimis rate will allow you to charge up to or allocate up to 10% of your modified total direct cost. So that's why the prior slide is so important because you have to know how to accurately calculate the amount that you can use as an indirect cost when um, using the de minimis rate for your application. You wanna keep in mind that if you are going to claim the de minimis rate on one application, you have to remain consistent. So if you actually do have an indirect cost rate agreement at your organization, you should be applying using your um, indirect cost rate agreement. If you choose not to, and you're gonna use the de minimis rate for a grant that you're applying for at let's say SAMHSA, but then you're applying somewhere else and you want to use the indirect cost agreement instead, you really, it needs to be consistent. So what you do for one, you do need to do for all. There is a link here um, on how to apply to get an indirect cost rate agreement. I know with a lot of, of um, new agencies, a lot of nonprofits, you um, need to get that established. So that particular link um, that you have, that we have provided, you will be able to use this link to get information on applying for an, an indirect cost rate agreement plan. Next slide, please. So we've just gone over the different categories as far as your budget categories for your total um, budget as far as your direct and indirect costs. So now we're going to get into the, why do I need this? You're going to be asked to submit what's called a budget justification. You may see it referred to as a budget narrative as well. And your budget, budget, your budget justification is going to provide a breakdown of all of the costs that you are putting into your budget. So you're going to have to have all of these different categories because these are the different categories that you want to, to speak to. Shanta referenced the SF424A, which is more of a summary of your budget. It might show personnel, $100,000, fringe, $50,000. But then you need this justification, this narrative that's going to speak more specifically to what is making up that total allocation for that particular budget category. And that is your budget justification. And you just wanna make sure that your budget justification on the other side, that it mirrors and it matches up with what you're saying you're doing in your work plan, what you're saying you're doing in your narrative. So if you are saying that you're going out and you need to have three vehicles because it helps you in doing site visits and you need to be able to reach your, um, the population that you are um, providing services to, make sure that your project narrative and your work plan speak to that being something that is being performed so that it can be looked at when we're looking at the cost principles and determining if it is necessary for the program, we are able to confirm according to this project narrative and this work plan, yes, it is necessary for um, vehicles to be, to be purchased um, for this program. Next slide, please. So here we're going to talk about your steps for creating a budget narrative, a budget justification. Again, you always want to make sure you're looking at the NOFO because more often than not, the NOFO is going to speak to um, what that particular program is looking for in their budget that you are being asked to prepare. Additionally, you want to make sure that you are going over and confirming that these different costs are allowable. Um, you wanna go into the CFR, what Shanta referred to, again, ECFR um, website, which I just went in today and saw it just had a facelift. It looks different than what it, it normally looks like. So um, if you're familiar with that site, I kind of got, I thought I was on the wrong side, on the wrong page. They just changed it. But you wanna go into the CFR and just make sure that you're looking at things to determine if they are actually allowable costs before you put it into the budget. Um, another place you can determine if it's allowable or not, you can look into the funding restrictions section of your notice of funding opportunity. And that will speak to things that may specifically not be allowed under that program. Um, 
again, you want to make sure that you are calculating your indirect costs accurately. If you're doing a de minimis rate, if you have an indirect cost agreement and you have various different rates within that agreement, on-site rates, off-site, things of that nature, you want to make sure you're using the correct rate for the cost for this particular program. And then again, you want to make sure that your format is um, following the guidance that you get in the NOFO. And if the NOFO provides a sample template, I will always say we are not allowed, the federal agency is not allowed to tell you how to format your budget. But if they provide a sample template, that's likely what they would prefer to see. So um, you kind of maybe just want to follow that because that would probably make it easier to make sure you're getting what they're looking for and easier for the people who are reviewing to, to be able to identify and find what they are looking for when they're doing the review process. And then you're now on your way to creating this budget, creating this justification and this narrative that will speak to all of the different categories that Shanta has um, gone through and explained to you. If we could get to the next slide, please. And so SAMHSA does have a very nice um, budget narrative justification that will be a document that will be sent out, I believe, after the presentation. But um, we, we do have it also embedded here for you as well. And again, you want to make sure when you are looking, because as Shanta said, not every grant is created equal, not every agency, even if you're applying somewhere else within HHS, everyone has their own different variables. So you want to make sure that you are paying attention to what that specific program, that specific agency is looking for. Because unfortunately, with grants, what's good for the goose is not always good for the gander, um, as far as that is concerned. So, um, and I do see that the link was placed in our comment section to take you to the sample budget narrative. Is, um, for anyone who is following along and trying to open it up, the link is available for you in the chat as well. Next slide, please. So again, I spoke briefly about the funding requirements and restrictions section. Um, again, you just wanna make sure that all of your costs and your budget are reasonable, allocable, allowable, and necessary for the completion of the program. Um, I was looking again in the chat and I saw some questions regarding tuition reimbursement, payroll costs, taxes. These things you're gonna find when you go on to the CFR. Taxes are outlined in detail for you at 200.470 of the CFR. And it gives very specific information depending on what type of tax it is, as far as whether it's allowable. Typically taxes are um, allowable, but to get the specifics and to make sure you cover all bases, one, you wanna refer to your NOFO to see if there's a restriction that is there. And also you can refer to 2 CFR 200.470 for that. Um, you wanna make sure you are just again, going through that funding restriction section with a fine tooth comb. Sometimes you will find items there like SAMHSA does not do construction grants. It will say construction funding is not allowed because it's, it's, it's not something that is allowable here or through that particular program. You may see restrictions or mentions regarding meals. Meals are typically going to be unallowable for most programs, but you may see that it has a stipulation. But if you are doing um, a research program and you're doing, um, you have subjects and patients that you're doing studies on, it it has an exception to allow meals for, for those types of circumstances. Um, if you have a Head Start program, so you have to provide meals to the children. Um, so you wanna make sure you are definitely paying attention to the funding restriction section to make sure that you are not submitting something that is going to be deemed unallowable and not able to be um, charged towards the grant. Also, um, you might find foreign travel, might be restricted um, or it may be allowable because of the program that you're, that you're working on, they may say, hey, we are allowing this. So you wanna make sure, again, you're checking there. That should also be with, where um, any reference to an 8% cap because of it being a training and technical assistance um, program, it should be referenced there for you as well. And you would also see any reference to pre-award costs. Um, they're not guaranteed to be allowable. Sometimes certain programs will allow 
um, pre-award costs, you want to make sure you are checking your notice of funding opportunity to see if they are allowable. And again, your um, pre-award costs are going to be just that, anything that you incurred prior to the start of your project period, or you may also hear that referred to as a period of performance. Anything prior to the start of your project period or period of performance, those costs may be allowable as a pre-award cost, but you wanna make sure you're checking your NOFO for that. Next slide, please. So again, you have your 424A that you need to submit in addition to the, the, the millions of other documents, the 424A, you do need to submit that. It is referred to as our budget information form. The 424A has multiple sections within, within that document. Section A is gonna be your summary section where you're gonna just maybe put in how much you're asking for in federal and how much you're proposing to provide in non-federal. Um, as Shanta mentioned, match requirements are statutory. So if you're, if the statute does not require match, you may, you will not be asked to provide a match. So you want to make sure you're aware of that as well. Not every federal grant is going to require a non-federal share. But if it does, you would want to make sure you're including that in Section A of the 424A. Section B is going to get into more of an overview. Um, and it's going to break it down by the categories that um, we went through earlier. And that's where you're just going to plug in your personnel totals, your friends, travel, contractual, et cetera. Section C is where you can um, kind of itemize and break out your non-federal resources. If you are um, providing non-federal share, you can break it out there. And then in section D, it's kind of like a forecast of um, of how you anticipate spending your money during the first four quarters of your first year. And then the last section, which is your um, section E, is going to be your future funding, your future um, federal funding. So if you're um, anticipating on a three-year award that year two, you're going to need another $200,000 in order to keep the, pro the project going. In year three, you're going to need $250,000. That's where you want to put in your projected um, future federal funding. And then again, you're going to need to submit your budget narrative, which is, again, just going to give the detail of all of the items that you are proposing to use your federal funds for. And you want to provide as much detail as possible so that your reviewers are able to determine the allowable um, allowability of those costs, as well as if they're um, necessary and if they're reasonable for the purpose of the program. Next slide, please. So. Here are some common errors that, um, that I, in my experience, found when reviewing budget applications. Um, some common things you want to just make sure that you pay attention to. The most common one, and I actually was having a conversation with a colleague about this earlier today, is that the application gets submitted with no budget. So you may have spent a lot of time preparing this wonderful budget that meets all of these bullets we've discussed and we can't see it because it's not in the application package. It's actually very common. Um, so you just wanna make sure you're actually submitting your budget. Um, next, you wanna make sure that you are providing how you came up with these costs. So again, if you are saying that for personnel, it, you're um, requesting $500,000, just how you came up with that. And I, I saw a lot of, um, chat in the chat box as well about how do you complete your personnel? You may not know what staff you're gonna have brought on. It's an estimate. It's not um, something that has to be definite. It's just an estimate. So however you came up with that estimation, make sure you are able to justify it. Um, the biggest thing you will find when you are dealing with uh, federal financial assistance is that justification is key. As long as you can justify it um, and it's within reason, just make sure that you are covering those bases. Um, but yes, if so, you may find yourself where you are projecting that you're going to have three directors, but based on the timing of your award, you are only able to hire two because you didn't have enough time. That's totally normal. Um, if this happens to you, don't panic. There are um, 
ways where you can do budget revisions and things of that nature, which um, I believe um, Beverly Vahinger, I'm hoping I pronounced her last name correctly, Dr. Vahinger, um, is the SAMHSA contact, and she would be able to get into more as far as those types of things after it's been awarded. But, um, but you would definitely want to try to be as accurate as possible in how many people you think are going to be in your staff or um, handling this program, handling this project. Um, making sure that the calculations you give actually add up. Um, it sounds, it's again, this sounds like, like bullet one, like something that you would think is not common, but it actually is. You may say, we need $500 for room and board for two nights. And it's because the rooms are, we need two rooms at $400 each. Well, that doesn't equal the $500. So just making sure that the calculations actually are adding up to the amount of the cost that you're listing. Um, also, you wanna make sure that you are submitting a budget for the entire project period, the multi-year. If it's a multi-year project and the NOFO is requesting multi-year um, budgets, you want to make sure you are including all of your budgets, not just the first year budget, if that is how it is worded within your NOFO that um, you are applying under. And you want to make sure that you are doing a cumulative, um, that you're not only submitting your cumulative budget, but you are breaking it out. So if you have a five-year project you're applying for and you're putting in your total for your five years, it needs to be broken out so that your reviewers can see how much you're saying you're doing for each budget year and in order to make sure that the budget years are aligning and that everything is allowable per budget year as well. And then um, sometimes your budget narrative will not align with what you put on um, section B of your 424A. Section B of your 424A may say personnel is 150,000, but then we get into the narrative and you have down $250,000 worth of allocations for your um, personnel section. So just making sure that the documents that you're submitting do match up with each other, everything is reconciling. And again, just make sure you are submitting these documents that you are working so hard to prepare. Next slide, please. So here we are at our helpful hints. Hopefully you guys find them as helpful as I did um, or that I'm hoping that you do. Again, your total cost. Total cost consists of direct and indirect costs. Um, next, you wanna make sure again that if there is a, um, a training grant or technical assistance grant, you remember the 8% cap. It should also be um, in, the, in the NOFO for you, the notice of funding opportunity. You want to make sure that everything is aligning and that all things match up because people actually are reviewing that. They are comparing your budget to the work you're proposing to do to make sure that you are um, allocating and requesting funds to match with what you're proposing that you're going to be doing in your project to make sure that these funds are actually needed to carry out the proposal for the project. Next slide, I'm sorry. Thank you. And lastly, on our helpful hints, you, um, again, just want to make sure you're justifying. You're justifying um, why these things are necessary, why they are needed to be, um, to perform the project. And you want to make sure that you are, if you're doing a multi-year budget, that you're accounting for a cost of living increase for your staff. Um, and that you are allowing inflation for certain things that we know may go up, utilities, rent, um, supplies, except things of that nature. And lastly, that you are just being realistic. I think Shanta touched on this before, just because the funding information um, within the NOFO says, hey, we, we have $5 million available for this project. If you know you don't need $5 million to carry out the project, don't feel that you have to um, apply for that total amount. And you just want to make sure that you are, again, being realistic about how you're going to spend these, these um, costs. Going back to what we said earlier, um, if you know that you're going to need to recruit in order to have your staff on board, maybe not say in year one, you're going to have eight people on your staff when you know you might only be able to realistically get four people on the staff and then build those people in to your, um, your future years. And I think this 
concludes our presentation. I believe our next slide is just our questions slide. Um, Thank yes. you, Ladiva. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ladiva and Shanta. Oh my gosh, so much good and rich information that you shared. We did have a lot of questions coming in through. So I encourage you to continue to put those through the Q&A because we are organizing them on the back end so that we do have a healthy amount of time for Q&A um, after our next presenter. So we will move on to introduce Beverly Watts Davis to share her perspective coming from a community-based organization who has sought and been successful um, in terms of getting a SAMHSA grant. So Beverly Watts Davis is currently the Chief Officer for Resource Development and Program Support and the Senior Vice President for West Care Texas. She has over 30 years of experience in leading and managing public agencies, nonprofit organizations, and private companies. And she has provided numerous nonprofit organizations with organizational development, strategic planning, grants and contract acquisition, training, TA, and program evaluation. So she served at the senior executive service level of the federal government as the director of a federal agency. Executive Director of San Antonio Fighting Back, Inc., Senior Vice President of the United Way of San Antonio and Bexar County, and, a, and an elected official in Austin, for Austin, Texas, for 11 years. So we're excited to hear from you, um, Bev. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, well, truly, good afternoon to all of you all. And I want to make sure that we that we that we're really a really respectful of time. But I want to congratulate everybody on the phone because number one, you're taking the first step to really helping your community. And this is after all, really about your community. Remember what a grant is, is nothing more than you all agree, dreaming on paper. You're dreaming on paper and you're offering your community. You're taking the hopes and wish, wishes of your community, both as what they're aspiring to so that they can be inspired by you all getting a grant and actually doing what it is that you wanna do. Next slide, please. So you all just had a wonderful overview with, with, with grants. And the only thing I want to say about this, so I'm not even going to go through this, but oftentimes to make sure that your budget lines up with your grant, my, my main tip to you all is to create the budget as you're writing your grant. And let me tell you why. Oftentimes you will see so many times when people give uh, the federal, that they respond, they, they provide a budget that doesn't match up with what they said they were going to do. And what, the, and what happens with that in the development of your grant, you're, you're dreaming, you're, you're thinking, oh, we wanna be able to do this. And we know that, that this, this neighborhood and this community needed that and they needed it. And you begin to put everything kind of into the soup. So then when you begin to narrow it down as to what you actually can accomplish, you're still thinking of all of the dreams and aspirations of your community. And then you go and you have that in your mind as you start writing out your budget. And I have seen this time and time again, where people will put things in their in their budget that they never mentioned in their grant. So that's my that's my I'm saying this to you all. This is a quick template. You can use this because normally one of your expenses, whatever you're talking about, is going to fit in one of these categories. And so I, I actually make just an outline. And as I'm going through and writing grants, I'm thinking, okay, personnel, that's going to go here. So and so is going to do that. Okay, that's going to be a contractor. And that way you're able to keep pace with what you're doing in terms of your, um, in terms of your grant. So next slide. So, so you all, this is, this is um, one of the things I just really have to just say to you, I have been so blessed with um, federal project officers that are absolutely amazing. I see some of them uh, on the phone now. I see Eileen, Eileen Bermudez, hello, and thank you for being amazing. Um, but you all, I want you all to know, the great thing is, is congratulations, you got a grant. And then I want you to go, oh no, we got a grant, <laughs> okay? You got the grant. I mean, you have both sentiments there because what that does mean is now you actually uh, have to get organized. But I wanna tell you the number one thing about all of this, that there is an old saying, and some of you may be too young to know this, but there's an old saying um, that, that's where someone from the federal government comes in and says, I'm with the federal government and I'm here to help you. I want you all to know they really are there to help you. And you really have to, you have to become best friends. You're becoming partners. You have now joined the family of SAMHSA. You are their grantee. You, they, have, they have 
deemed you worthy to be their partner to actually help solve problems in your community. And what you all must do is understand this is your main obligation. It is to serve your community. SAMHSA is giving you money to serve and to do things that make conditions, behaviors, communities, individuals, families better. And so what it's really, this is what your job is. It's your mission. And it is not a mission impossible. It is a mission possible. So I want to be able to make, when it comes to the budget, you all do understand, and this has been a common mistake with many, many nonprofits, is they relegate the budget and the responsibility of the budget to the person who's the accountant or the bookkeeper. Okay? No. The budget is everybody's responsibility. Everybody. And if you and when you when you first start out, one of the most important things you do is you should train all your staff about the importance of the fiscal accountability as a part of their orientation. So anybody who comes in, they learn about the budget. And then you make sure that they understand that they have to reconcile with what they're doing with what's in your budget on an ongoing basis. This is not something that you try to do 12 months later. This is not something you try to do months and months later. You all, this is, again, you have been, and I say the word blessed, you've been blessed to be able to, to have some, an entity invest in you. And so it's important that everybody realize it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that they're adhering to a budget and that they're not going off and doing something that's, that, that you have to make up for, you have to move things around. There'll be times when you have to move things around to accommodate and meet the needs of your community, but it should not be something that's not, you know, that, that, that you're, that's totally, that, that you're not, that, that people are just doing because they're just not paying attention to the budget. It's everybody's responsibility. So one of the things that was actually spoken, that was said by the, by the speakers ahead, before me, is one of the things that you really should think about is when you're looking, take, once you've gotten the award, you're going to be doing this, you're going to complete what you're doing, the implementation is going to be on a yearly basis. So it's important that you outline the job that you need to get done for that year. And then remember, your, and I say that to you because people forget that you, when you applied for the grant, you're applying for multiple years. And in your mind, you're thinking you have five years or three years to do something. Well, when you're doing your budget to make sure you're responsible in terms of your implementation plan for that year, it's really important that you focus in on what you're doing in that year so that your budget is matching up to that. Because people forget that you have five years to complete something and then they also try to do it all in one year. It, that's why I'm saying to you, if you physically draw this out, it reminds you that you have more than one year to try to do everything. And this is also really important because you all, oftentimes in implementation, it is in your head that you, that you have all these things you wanna do. You, you must remember, you don't have to do everything. You don't have to do everything. Um, you don't have to do everything. That's why you have partnerships and you sure as heck don't have to do it all in one year. So again, match, your, match up the, that annual budget with your outline. Now, this one, you all, is, I, I have to, this is, I want you all to put two stars and check, 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 check by what I'm getting ready to say. Your grants from SAMHSA, or your grants from, in most of the federal agencies, and I've had grants from uh, uh, 35 different federal agencies, so I, this has been true for all of them. In most cases, this is a reimbursable grant, and no one really talks to you about what that means. So I need to say to all of you all, please know this. When you get a grant, and for those of you who haven't been funded, they do not give you a check up front. I need to say this. Now, people may think that everybody knows this, but I cannot tell you how many nonprofits that I have worked with over the years that did not understand this. They do not give you a check up front. You spend the money and then you get reimbursed for it. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's really important for you all to understand in terms of your planning, because this is what gets people in trouble uh, in terms of um, truly just their budgeting. For a reimbursable grant, it's really important that you understand what your cash flow is. 
So this means you have to do some pre-planning on the ground that doesn't that you're not going to hear in a grant presentation. This means you you must make sure that you in some cases that you have to you establish a line of credit with your bank or or ask for a percentage of your funding up front. Remember, you you may be a nonprofit, but a, but a nonprofit is a business. People believe that because you have a charitable purpose that some of the business practices do not apply to you. That is not true. A nonprofit is a business. You, you, but again, you're just not making profits, but you are a business. So it is really important for you to plan for your, for your cash flow and plan for this because you're going to be surprised when you, you're looking that you find out that you have to be reimbursed, which also means it is really important for you to plan to make sure that your billing is done in such a way that it supports your cash flow needs. This is where, this is again, where most nonprofits that I have dealt with, in particular the smaller ones, get into real trouble is that they don't understand that you don't get paid until you send in a bill to the government, your invoice to the government. And, and, and again, there's a whole reimbursement process and then they're going to, and then they oftentimes, then they will deposit the money into, oftentimes they'll deposit the money into your account. But that depends on, I've seen so many of you all wait six months before you send in a bill and then you're panicked because you can't make payroll. So again, ladies and gentlemen, and all of you heroes and sheroes out there, because you have all of my, all of my honor and kudos and snaps and way to go to you all because you're doing what your community needs, but you then have to do what your community needs. And that means you must be solvent and you must be stable so that you can deliver that service. That's one of the most important things I want you all to realize is, is that you have to plan for if you do get the grant, you have to plan to make sure that you have a cash flow that supports it. So again, I, I just want to be able to make sure that when you are doing that and you're getting ready to invoice things, you all please do hear me on this. When you're when you're putting all this together, the practical thing is to invoice the federal government, you have to have ways to show that you actually spent your money. You can't just say, oh, I spent it on personnel and I spent, you have to show the government, we actually did this. So what does that mean? This is how this breaks this down. How do I prove this to the federal government that I actually did spend money that I should be getting reimbursed for? So again, on your staffing, one of the most common things that you can do in terms of your, bu in terms of your budget is to actually use your payroll register, your register. Because it oftentimes, much of our, most of you all think about a payroll company that automates all of this for you because they will generate payroll registers for you. You guys, for, for your supplies, the most, I, this is just my suggestion. I'm not advertising for any agent or any business, but I will tell you one of the most important things to do to show that you have actually bought supplies is to, to provide the statement from an office supply company that allows you, that has allowed you to, you know, the, in which you're, they're, they're billing you because they will itemize everything you bought and that will serve, um, if it, that will serve as your receipt. If you are, um, if you can, please get a credit card. And I, and I love um, what, was, what Ms. Johnson said earlier is that your credit card is very much like you cannot take this money and go to, um, you know, Tahiti. The, the point is, is that, you, you must you use your credit card you know, to show for the company all the things that you did for this grant, for your federal grant. You cannot and do not, do not, do not, do not mix any personal charges with your organizational charges. It needs to be clear. And I'm saying this to you all because again, these are the best practices are wrong and these are things that will get you in trouble. I want to ask you all, just because this always comes up and it will come up as you are implementing your program, have a folder that you put receipts in that are actual hard receipts because you're gonna have things that come up for events, trainings, marketing, you wanna do something, you have to hire a sound system. You have a receipt. It's real easy, trust me you all, it's real easy to forget where you put that receipt. You've gotta have some sort of system where you take those receipts, you put it in a folder, and put it away until the time gets ready for you to bill. And lastly, like I said, if, if, if cash flow is an issue, and but truly, just as matter of practice, bill monthly. And if, and if cash flow is a, is a problem or a concern, 
than bill every two weeks. The federal government is going to pay you. That's the one good thing is they are solid in the fact that they will pay you. If you are presenting your bills and they're legitimate and allowable costs, you will get paid. And this will make sure that you, that, you know, that you get done, that you're able to continue to do what you need to do for your community. Next slide, please. So having said that, Three things I just want to talk to you about in terms of being able to build around, being able to be solid in your financials, being financially stable as you have grants. And I hate to just say this to you all, because if you do not do this right, um, the, the worst case scenario is that you literally get in trouble because you didn't plan. Um, you, 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 you can't make payroll, you didn't, you forgot to build, all of these kinds of things. So I want to make sure that along with, with having a grant from the federal government is that you take that opportunity because someone is now investing in you, that you think about what you have to do to make sure you are stable. You need to be stable because again, you're bringing a service to your community and your community needs you. So we need for you to be okay so that you can continue to do what you do. When you think about your infrastructure, and all organizations need a strong infrastructure. So it's important for you to think about how you build that capacity. You heard uh, the previous speakers talk about an indirect rate. Many, many nonprofits do not understand what an indirect, why it, that you, to have an indirect rate and why it's important. The reason that it is important you all is because it, it literally addresses your administrative costs and your overhead. And, and as, you are, as you are doing what you need to do in your communities, these are the hidden costs that end up, and I will tell you, that end up um, costing your agency. This is your cost of doing business. And if you do not have a way to cover that, what it does is it eats into your capacity to deliver services. So I want you all to at least think about that. Work with your project officer. Work to, to, to get their guidance and for them to actually help you. They'll steer you in the right direction on actually how to do that. But that's really just something to think about. In terms of building your program capacity, and I spoke about this a little bit earlier, think about how do you leverage your resources? And once again, this comes, to, this comes back to my point when I said, you don't have to do everything. And we are now in a time, and COVID actually did this because it made people rethink how they operate. I, am, I have seen many, many more nonprofits who are now um, deciding to co-locate with other like programs um, to, to, to better serve communities. If you are dealing with uh, people in treatment or people with behavior with, with behavioral health concerns, we have seen all over the country where someone comes to you and they get a referral and they have to get in their car and they drive somewhere else and then they're waiting to get in and, and, and the wait time, sometimes they just decide to leave. And so they don't get the substance abuse or the mental health services that they need. And I have seen this all across the country. It's really important for you to figure out how do you begin to serve your people better? You cannot do everything because the funding that, that you're provided doesn't normally allow you to, pro to provide for everything. So it is really key for you to think about how you do partnerships, um, how you do match, how do you do the things that help to build your program capacity? And lastly, um, you also got to realize that you've got to build equity up in what you're doing. And that means that toward the end, on day one, think about how you can be able to do fundraising strategies, how you do capital campaigns, because these are things that are going to literally help support your financial stability. And lastly, in the last slide, last slide, I want to say this to you all. On day one, when you go, yay, we got the grant, and then you go, oh, we got the grant. On day one, when you start planning with your community, you all come together. On that very, very, I'm going to give you one month after 30 days, it's really important for you all to start thinking about, okay, so what happens when these dollars are no longer here? You have to start thinking on the 31st day, how are you going to sustain this effort? And so, like I said, do this in the first quarter, in the first month, but what are you going to do when these dollars end? And this is when you start on your journey, because do understand, this is really, you are on an adventure. That adventure is, 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 what you're, is what you're doing to be able to make sure that you're serving your community. And that adventure means that you're going to be collecting information along the way. You're gonna be collecting resources along the way. You're collecting partners along the way. All of those things are assets to you. And, and, how, you, and how you begin to use those people 
to leverage resources, you know, to connect you to other local funding sources, to, 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 to be able to build your donor and your volunteer base. All of those things are what you're collecting along the way. And, and then as you're collecting them along the way, this is what you're going to use to help you utilize all your contacts and secure additional funding to sustain both the outcome and then to grow the effective program components. Not always will you always continue your, your entire program, but there are gonna be things out of there that you really, really do well that really make a difference in your community. Those are definitely the things that you want to, you want to sustain. And they're also the things that when you do them well, other funders will fund. But your journey along the way is helping people to see, to be a part of your journey, number one, but then also to see the outcomes that you're really reaching and the effectiveness um, that you're, how effective you're becoming in addressing a community problem. So again, I just wanna, I wanna thank you all. I feel like I was a Federal Express commercial. I was trying to make sure I allowed for, for all the other speakers uh, to be able to, to visit with you all. Um, I, again, I wanna, I, I say to all you heroes and sheroes, Welcome to, uh, the, to the family of SAMHSA grantees. It, it, it is an adventure. Um, and what's really important, as I said, your project officer is your best friend, but so are all the other people that, you, the, that you're gonna meet along this journey. And a lot of that are going to be phenomenal resources, the NED, all the people that are in the NED and all the people who you partner with and all the people who you meet who are other grantees. Those are all a part of your toolkit um, and your treasure chest as you make this journey. And I have to just say, think of this as the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy, two things came out of the Wizard of Oz. Number one, when Dorothy finally made it home, uh, what, she, what, what was really key about the Wizard of Oz is that Dorothy went on an amazing journey. And that is what life is. And you're, an amazing, you're on an amazing journey for your community. But then the other thing that was so very important about uh, the journey that, that Dorothy took, it was the people who she met along the way and who helped her uh, helped her end her journey successfully. Same thing with you. All the people you meet, the volunteers you meet, your project officers, the other grantees, the NED, all of these people are the ones you meet along the way that are going to help you successfully get to home and to, to, your, to your point. So thank you all for letting me be a part of this session today. Thank you, Bev. Truly, uh, so many gems that you shared with our participants today. Really appreciate you, Shanta and Ladiva, for being here. Uh, there, our Q&A and our chat has been blown up with lots of questions, so we are going to move into that portion of the section now. want to just remind participants that the Q&A is for our speakers to share their experience and to give broad and general advice. Um, not, we're not as able to provide any specific advice or comment on a specific notice um, or application or scenario. Uh, we are going to try to get to as many questions as we can during our time left. And we're really excited to have four SAMHSA staff members also from the Office of Financial Resources join the panel to answer any specific SAMHSA questions. So we have George, uh, Roger George, Eileen Bermudez, Brian Rivera Lopez and Christopher Kraft. Um, so we are happy to have you join us as well. So we did go through your registration, your questions through the registration and try to bucket them. Also I've been kind of putting some of your Q, uh, questions that have come in live into some of these questions as well. So we'll go through this and I'll try to direct them to uh, the panelists who, whom can answer the question. So the first question is around what preparation can I do before my organization submits a grant application? We did hear a little bit about that in terms of cash flow and getting a line of credit, uh, but we'll turn it back over to Shanta and Ladiva first, if they might offer any other additional suggestions. I actually think that um, what, what Ms. Beverly just spoke to is is very very much the, the things you want to look at I, I would also say um when you are trying to get ready to apply um there are various things that you need to take into consideration not just as far as the budget but you want to make sure that you do have all of the things you need in place as far as your um registration with sam.gov um that you are um 
you know, that you have your, your DUNS information, all the things that those specific things that you need um, in order to be able to go on and apply. Um, I would encourage you, of course, to peruse grants.gov and look at forecasts for notices of funding opportunities that have not yet been published so that you can kind of look at those and see what things they're saying you need um, in order to be an eligible applicant to, to be able to prepare yourself for that. And um, I do agree with Ms. Beverly again, you know, as you're looking and you're looking at what the objective is for this particular project that you want to apply for, making sure that you do have the means to sustain it, um, which um, is oftentimes the purpose of, of the match is to show that you're able to invest in and sustain this um, program with your own um, resources as well, that you're, you're not solely relying on the federal government because the hope is that these programs will still carry on in the event that the, pro the project ends or you're no longer um, a recipient of the federal funding. So just doing an overall look at your organization and what, what resources internally you know you have and making sure that you do um, possess the things that are needed to carry out those objectives. Um, and again, like I said, SAM.gov, huge thing. You got to make sure you're on there. It's an annual renewal on SAM.gov. If you're not up to date on SAM.gov, you're, you're not going to be able to get through on Grants.gov when you go when it's time to apply. So just making sure you get that started. Um, it's It takes a few weeks. It could take actually here lately with the delays because you have to send in a certified letter. It could take closer to a couple of months to get that process finalized. So it's definitely something you wanna get a jump on because typically a NOFO is only gonna give you a roughly close to 60 days um, to apply. So if the process is taking 60 days with SAM.gov, you run the risk of not being able to submit your application because you weren't able to get your um, registration set up on SAM.gov in time. Right. So thanks for that suggestion, Ladiva. Good to just do that right now, then, um, even if you don't have an announcement that you're interested in responding to. Shanta, it looks like you're going to offer some I just wanted info. to add, because I actually had seen a question um, pop up, and I thought it was a great question. And there was um, an organization that said, you know, we really don't think we're ready for this. You know, we don't have a lot of the um, historical information, the baseline information. So what should we do? And I think it's just worth saying to the office, or to the audience, excuse me, office, audience, timing is, is important. And we don't want to see you set yourself up for failure. You know, right, Miss Beverly? You know, you don't want to just say, I saw a NOFO and I'm off to the races and you really don't have what you need to Ladiva's comment. So there's value in, I think, taking the honest assessment of where your organization is. Of course, you can go do market research. You know, so if you don't have um, information in your organization about, you know, hourly wages or, you know, how much certain things are going to cost, you can still go out and do market research and find out what the fair market value norms are for things. There are ways you can, of course, go out online and find out what hourly rates, you know, and things are for different positions. But I think it's worth saying to somebody on this call that may feel like, I really don't feel like I'm ready, but I feel like I need to go and do something. And we want you to be successful. And so if you really are not ready because you don't have the infrastructure, these kinds of webinars, talking to um, grants management specialists, POs, um, you know, YouTube is just a, a plethora of freebies where you can get all kinds of information to help you learn this process. So please don't put yourself in a position where you are not going to be successful and you get frustrated because you just want to kind of put the cart before the horse. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. Thank you. Bev, what would you add in? Well, one thing I, I would say to everyone, please, you all find out who else is doing this work in your community. I mean, whether or not, you know, you choose to go after this, really, you may have resources in that can actually answer all these questions. But this also goes to you all in, in, in all the grants that I've ever written, and I've written a whole lot. There is a section that really asks you, what problem are you trying to solve in some way? It's sometimes people call it a needs assessment. Sometimes people call it, you know, problem solving question or whatever it is. But they're asking you, why would you go after this grant? In, in, why would you go after this grant? 
a needs assessment isn't something that you need to do just when you are getting a grant. Truly what Ms. Johnson just said, no, do your, do your research. And you guys, if you do this now, find out everything, all the kinds of data about your community. Even if it's not for this grant, it may help you with others because you're trying to connect the dots in your community with resources. So when you do your needs assessment, find out all this stuff then because you're going to find not only is somebody else doing it, but there may be a problem that nobody is addressing that may become your niche. But do, do your, as she said, do your market research. Find out what else is out there, who's done it, and they may spend some time with you to tell you what it really means to get this done well. And that will be gold for, for your help. Great. Thank you so much. The next Hi, question. Uh, this that, is Chris oh, Crouch, uh, OFR and SAMHSA. I just wanted to add a couple of things if I could. Of course. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention too, um, I, I know Ladiva mentioned about, you know, getting registered and having the proper registrations. Um, and if you look at the uh, FOA, the NOFOs, excuse me, we used to call them FOAs. The NOFOs will have, um, all SAMHSA NOFOs have an appendix, um, which ours is appendix A, it'll talk about application and submission requirements. So you'll see every um, area where you need to get registered. Um, so please take the time to read through the NOFOs very carefully. As, as Beverly mentioned too, um, it's really, there's a ton of information listed in, in there um, to help guide you through this process. Um, not only from a registration standpoint, but also from the standpoint of like who to reach out to if you have questions for particular areas um, that affect your submission of the application. So you'll see um, a list of uh, a program person that you can reach out to about program questions. Um, you'll see someone from our grants management um, um, staff uh, that you can reach out to them about grants management questions, budget questions um, before you submit. And also there'll be um, grant review staff listed as well who can help you with that submission process. So, um, you know, we have to use the ERA common system for SAMHSA submissions. Um, that's a registration process in and of itself. And um, we are here to help you do that. So, you know, we have everybody listed um, in the, the NOFO. So please um, be careful to kind of look through that and, and see if you're having troubles, reach out to us so we can help you um, to, to get that information um, and to get your application kind of sorted out. Great, thank you for adding that in, Chris. All right, let's go on to the next question around what are some of the steps to take in grant seeking? Some of these have already been addressed, but just curious to see if there are any other additional steps. Um, Bev, you offered, you know, look at, do your own scan, look at who's in the neighborhood, um, other things that you would want to add in. One, one of the things is, is, is this really kind of goes to strategic planning in a community. And truly, um, um, Dr. Valander, Ms. Um, Ms. Johnson, uh, ha, the, people have touched on this already, but, but what's, what's very key, you all, in grant seeking, please do not let this be about chasing money because you will be sorely disappointed. You will do a whole lot of work. And number one, if you're lucky enough to get grants, you will not get your outcomes. So this is really important for what, what I would tell you to do is to see what, it, what is out there. And, and I can't emphasize enough about your needs assessment. But the other thing that you need to, to also make sure that you do is check your labor market. Because what, what you, if you, not everybody has, I can tell you, there, there is a, a real tight market right now on trying to get people who are licensed professional counselors and mental health professionals. So you have to just know if you can even get the staff that you need to be able to do that. But again, do your homework ahead of time do your market research, as Ms. Johnson said. Um, I, I, just, I just really have to just tell you that. And 
uh, before you decide that you want to do this. Great, thank you. And that's probably really helpful too for those newer organizations that may not have had a one-year budget or are not sure about their staff. And so I, what I heard Ladiva say earlier too was just you just need to be able to justify it, right? So if you do your market research and then can justify salaries, that's helpful. So let's move on to the next question. I'm kind of rushing us through a little bit because I know there are a lot. Um, so there was a question around when developing a proposal and budget, how can you provide details but and leave some room still for flexibility? <laughs> Curious around strategies for that for any one of our panelists or SAMHSA um, team members to respond to. Well, well I, I, I'll just simply say, because this is really a writing question, um, you all, SAMHSA now, thank goodness, but SAMHSA actually has, most of its grants are, are 10 pages, 10 pages single space, which is literally 20 pages double space. Other agencies, CDC, um, her, you're, gonna, you're, took, you're talking about 40 single space pages um, or, or 20 single space pages, which is 40. Um, so I, this is, really about when you have 10 pages, you have to figure out what you want to say and be concise. What this really goes to is you all want to tell us, we're asking you what time it is. And oftentimes people want to tell us how to build a clock. That's not what we're asking you. We're not, we're asking you what time is it, not how to build a clock. So you really have to focus in on being able to make your, to provide the details, to, to answer the question and and, and, and honestly, the flexibility, there is none. I, I'm just, I'm just going to say this straight up. You guys, it's 10 pages. It's, it's 20 pages. It's whatever it is. That's it. So you've got to be able to train yourself on how you're going to answer those questions within the time, within the space that you're given. Now, now figure it, I will give you all this. This is some grant tips real quickly. If you put things in charts, you get to you can move from ten point pitch uh, from twelve point pitch to ten point pitch. SAMHSA allows that. Not everybody else does. That gives you a little bit more room because I know everybody has a tendency to want to tell SAMHSA everything because if you tell them everything, surely they will see how important this is to your community and they will fund you. I understand and I get it and I know it. They know it too. But you guys, you have to train yourself. You got ten pages. You got ten pages. You got ten pages. And so, and make sure you answer the question. And one of the things, another tip, this is just coming from as a peer reviewer. Oftentimes, um, if you put the question before you put the answer, before you put your response, as a peer reviewer, it's a subliminal plus for you. And let me tell you why. If I'm a peer reviewer and I gotta read the question and then look at your answer, and I gotta read the question and look at the answer, I will, I, my, this is my opinion, I believe that people will appreciate you more in a grant competition. You want everybody to appreciate you more. If I can just look at one piece of paper and see that you wrote the question and then you answered the question. You wrote the question and you answered the question. As a grant tip, I am telling you, um, years and years of experience and years and years as a reviewer, you may want to think about that. Thank you, Vav. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, let's go on to the next question, which is around um, how to estimate staff time and costs. Uh, again, I think this question may have come up during your presentation to um, during all of your presentations. <laughs> so just quick, anything that you want to add in, Shanta? Bev or Ladiva? That one's for Ms. Harris. <laughs> I'm volunteering. I just volunteered you. <laughs> and I really, you know, and I really like to kick things back to SAMHSA um, because, as we said at the top of the presentation, you know, we are from the Office of the Secretary and we're leading the, um, um, we've set up a grants management training academy for the uh, department. And um, we're here as a result of some training that we did for Samson's executive leadership. So, Chris, not to put you on the spot, but I think um, 
<laughs> that it's your shop. And I, I understand the dance between uh, making sure that the opt-in um, is giving the right information um, to potential applicants. So we don't, we don't want to not let you do sure. that. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. Actually, um, I don't work uh, in the Department of Budget at, at SAMHSA. So Roger, do you think you could answer that one? I'm actually in grant review. It's a little different, but Roger's on, I think, right? Or I yeah, yes, I, I'm on. And okay. uh, I think it, it goes back to, I think, what uh, Ms. Beverly Watts was saying earlier. Um, you submit your budget based on your projected needs, your needs assessment for the community. You look at your market rates for labor, ensure you have the right labor and the costs associated for it. Um, again, when you submit your budget, it is like, like Beverly said, it is an actual budget, but it is an estimated projected budget for the upcoming 12 months. And so you want to detail the budget as best as you can to execute your project activities to be successful. And in doing so, there's labor category based on the type of personnel you need, the type of resources, type of contracts you're going to think about pursuing. So I would get those estimates, do some pre-planning, um, ensure that, again, even if you are getting contracted services or you need a specialized consultant to be part of the project, that they are available and what are the going rates. So when you project in your budget, those costs are affiliated and reflected in those budgets. And again, with all supported costs is your documentation and justification for the needs of these costs and how it helps further the goals and objectives of the project you're you're applying for. So, so those are some key things. It's hard to get into details, but generally that's what I would say is what you want to pay attention to. Great. Thank you, Roger. There was another question in the chat that had to do with how to note changes in salary and fringe from um, if if you're applying um, for a particular fiscal year, but it doesn't line up with the calendar year and the organization maybe does salary rate like increases in January. So how do you kind of indicate um, salary and fringe increases when the fiscal year doesn't match up with the calendar year? That's kind of a technical question, but wondering if somebody has a quick tip on how to deal with that. So I'll jump in for that one. <laughs> when you submit your detailed budget, one of the main things, and uh, that's what Ms. Harris had mentioned earlier, one of the main things we're looking for is a justification so that we can determine that all the costs that you include within your budget are reasonable, allowable, and allocable. So the more detail, the more breakdown, the more explanation that you give us, uh, it makes it easier for us to determine that these costs are, are allowable. Um, one of the things that, uh, as far as the level of effort, um, oftentimes what we, what we ask is that, and it's in our sample budget also, that you provide um, the level of effort multiplied times the, um, the salary, and that way we can um, have an estimate of what the SAMHSA grant is gonna be charged. As far as fringe benefits, so one of the things you wanna make sure is that um, for the budget year that we're funding, um, the costs that fall within that particular budget year, if, if the raise is gonna come in like in the middle of the year, there is an opportunity perhaps to revise your budget, um, explain your costs of the increase of the salary. Sometimes we'll ask you for your organizational um, policy uh, so that uh, we can determine how increases are determined within your organization. Um, but there is a chance of revising your budget um, to accommodate that increase. Thank you. All right, we need to, to bring this to a close, I know that we're um, getting close to the hour and some folks are having to get off early. Just a reminder that a recording and the resources will be available on our website. We do wanna note that there are some upcoming resources as well. The webinar that was mentioned earlier by Dr. Be uh, Beverly Vehinger, uh, and we'll, you'll have that information available in the follow-up email. Also, there are a couple of um, resources available on, on um, culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and healthcare. We encourage you to check that out as well. And just a reminder, if you're not a part of the NED yet, we do want you to join um, and so that you can take advantage of these other these opportunities that we hope to continue to provide to you. 
So with that, I want to pass it over to Dr. Mary Rory to give a quick thanks uh, to our amazing <laughs> panelists and to you all for joining us today. <laughs> Bravo, you are worth stellar. Oh my God, I'm educated. And I encourage everyone out there to watch this video before you submit your next grant. You got this. You already heard that you got this. You attended today because you care about the communities that you are serving. You realize that it's much bigger than you. So big, super, massive, colossal thanks to all of you. Stay safe, stay healthy, because we got so many more lives to save. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. And please Thank do you. provide feedback through our link. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bermudez. Thank you, Mr. Kraft. Thank you, Mr. George. And I'm missing somebody. And thank you, all of you all. Thank you so very, very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Perry. Mm -hmm.